Alright, so today we've got a controversial box. Uh, I'm going to start, I think we won't call it that. We'll call it the Deutsch box because he's the only one who suggested a name for it. So we're just going to name it after him. So we've got the Deutsch box. Except then people will think I'm saying it's the German box. That doesn't really work. Anyways, we've got a controversial box and a, a spoiler section for today's episodes. This will be fun. This is another example of an obvious plot, uh, except well-executed, that I like. You know, the, the obstructionist bureaucrat, the obvious moral dilemma, the outcome of the hearing, you know. All of that is stuff that is fairly easy to predict. And you see coming from a mile away. But I still enjoyed this episode, especially on repeat viewing. Especially, especially on repeat viewing. <sighs> Once again, I remind you, no spoilers in the comments section. So, <clears throat> I don't actually have that many notes, uh, as weird as this sounds. This was just a treat to rewatch. I do find it interesting, the respect that was on display between the Narn and Sinclair. Uh, this is the sort of thing that I feel will, will grow over time. And... I was wondering why that is, and it occurred to me the answer is actually quite simple. It's the respect of a worthy opponent. Several times now Sinclair has butted heads, so to speak, with the Narn and won. He has not destroyed the Narn. He has not humiliated them, sowed their, you know, sowed their lands with salt and eaten the marrow from their bones or anything like that. He hasn't done anything horrible to the Narn, but he did defeat them in combat, even if it was political combat. And that's the kind of thing that people like the Narn would respect. So I like the fact that uh, there's that there's that there's that respect returned, in re and I also like the fact that Sinclair's always bothered to try and reach out to the Narn, even when they've basically been his enemies, um, with really only the one exception on that. And I, ju I just think it's a nice touch. So the Dilgar uh, is the name of the species that our lady I had to write it on her name because I kept forgetting it. Uh, Jadur. J-H-A-D-U-R, apparently. Jadur. Um, she's a member of. The Dilgar is something that we never really hear more about, and yet it's one of those wonderful aspects of world-building that Babylon 5 is so good at. In this single episode, we understand a great deal about the League of Non-Aligned Worlds and the politics thereof, and the nature of why EarthGov is viewed the way it is in modern galactic politics. The Dilgar, I like to liken unto the space pirates in Metroid. Now, I know you're looking at me weird on that, but hear me out. The Space Pirates' greatest asset in Metroid has always been the fact that they don't care about things like morality or ethics. They are capable of accomplishing feats so much beyond everyone else because they're willing to push that much harder. They have greater technology, they have stronger military, they are basically just superior in terms of raw numbers. I don't mean like how many of them, I mean like their, their stats, basically, than basically any of the other races within the Metroid setting, at least the ones that are still ad running around, because, you know, obviously there would be uh, a couple of races that would be better than if they were still around. Anyways, and that's what I feel like with the Delgar, a race that just does not care about the ethics or morality of a situation, a race that was just abstractly conquest. There's one scene where for about two seconds there's a screen that shows, and I actually paused this time around to read it. I didn't write down all the details, but it listed numbers, like four entire sectors that she and her armies personally conquered, and several, several planets whose species were, whose, the planetary populations of those entire planets were wiped dry. That says something for the mentality of the Dilgar, and it says a lot for the League of Non-Aligned Worlds. Also, by the way, we know that the League was around back then, which is also relevant. The League is interestingly presented here, because the League has basically been a non-entity up until this point in time. This is the first episode where the League steps into the spotlight a little bit, and they will be here in the future, which I think is a good thing. Um... The parallels between this and the UN are obvious, but really, you could parallel this to basically any multi-country, multinational, multi-state organization across human history. Because the, it's always the same idea. In fact, Sinclair himself says it flat out towards the end of the episode, are the big guys always going to be pushing around the small? Uh, paraphrasing a little bit. And... The idea here is you've got an organization, these groups have the power in this organization. They are stronger, they have more military, stronger economy, more territory, you know, whatever. And then there's a bunch of other powers which combined basically equal out to one of the bigger powers. And in fact, in the League, or, or in, in Babylon 5, the entire League of Non-Aligned Worlds, which I believe has like 14 seats, I want to say, uh, has one vote compared to, you know, the Centauri who have one, the Membari who have one, the Narn who have one, and Earth who has won. 
Now, again, this is all just world building and setting building and politics, which is, of course, why I eat it up. Uh, but one of the things I love about it is it also, again, highlights why Earth is so well respected in, in the modern society. 30 years ago, Earth came around and said, no, we're coming to the aid of the, the League of Non-Aligned Worlds. And they were basically the only ones who did. The only ones who, who put their significant military and economic might behind helping these otherwise disparate worlds fighting against the uni unified front of the Dilgar. And that's the kind of thing that's going to resonate and is probably one of the reasons why they were considered, for the first time, a major player in the galactic scenario. Until that point in time, and this is, of course, just juxtaposition, but I imagine uh, Earth Alliance, Earth Gov, whatever you want to call them, was considered just another one of the non-aligned worlds until that moment. And then it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, I am reminded a little bit of Mass Effect, but of course I am, because as we've discussed many times, Mass Effect was inspired by Babylon 5. But the, the point remains, there was the, the major event during which Earth actually became a major player, and then pff, just catapulted from that point on, never stopped uh, expanding. But I don't want to get too much into that, because that's in the future. Um, then there's the thing about the Wind Swords. Now, I caught that immediately, but of course I did. Uh, because I've seen this series before. But my point is, uh, when I first heard the term Wind Swords, my first reaction to when I first watched this show was, huh? And then I find out who and what the Wind Swords were, and my response was, oh, God. And this is the first time we find out that the Minbari are not a race of hats. This is something I actually like about Babylon 5 in general. Very few of the races, I should say, none of the major races are a race of hats. If you don't know what I mean by this, because uh, I've talked about this over in Voyager several times, the idea is it's usually difficult, if not impossible, especially in a episodic format like a TV show, to flesh out an entire culture within a single episode. It very rarely happens. Um, so when you have an episode where there's a species that shows up and they're only there for that one episode, usually they have a hat. What this means is they have basically a character trait, and that character trait applies to the whole race universally. It is a way, it, now some people decry this because it's lazy, and I've been on that side as well, but I think it's a little more gray than that, especially on re repeat thinking. I've talked about this in Voyager again, because it's, it's an effort, you know? Sometimes it is done lazily. Sometimes everyone is university, but that's not always done. Sometimes it's done to try and add depth to a race that otherwise would have none or would just be a race of non-people, you know, trying to add something to them. And of course, as has been discussed, usually major races get fleshed out to the point where they do not have a hat. The point of all of this is here in, uh, here in Babylon 5, in, in my opinion, at least over the course of the show, none of the major races are a race of hats. And this is probably the first time we really get to see the Minbari be fleshed out past their their current status. The idea of the wind swords, the uh, the militant extremists, the fact that the government was willing to take terrible, disgusting, horrible weapons devised by uh, I wrote down her name. Jod I keep remembering her as Death Walker, so I keep having to write down her name, Jadur. Uh, and, and, and use them in the war against the Earth. You know, all that horrible, horrible stuff is just one little shading. It's the beginnings of fleshing out the Membari as a culture rather than, you know, the hat thing. Um, I love the Narn scenes between Jakar and Natoth. I don't have much to add to that. They're just great chemistry, and it really, again, just helps to highlight Narn mentality. You know, I her willing, her desire to, to fulfill her vendetta oath, which is... A pretty important thing we can tell just by looking at it. And his desire to help her do that, but him asking her to sacrifice of it to, to accept the non-beneficial circumstances just to ensure that the Narn people will be benefited by it. You know, it again goes to that self-sacrificing thing of the Narn and the desire to, uh, to keep that oath kind of thing. One little note about that. I love the fact that Jakar had the opportunity right there, bam, just like that, to take that immortality serum, you know, the longevity vaccine, and to take it for their people, and it would it would bolster their people and help them help the entire Narn regime to new heights of power and glory. And all she asked for that was his assistant's head, Natoth's head, delivered to her within the hour. It's all she asked for that, and he declined. I mention this because this is the second time now that we have seen that Jakar is not an evil character. Now, most of you who are watching this have seen this series before, and so your response is, well, duh! 
But remember, from the perspective of the first time you watched this, Jakar was portrayed as a villain for most of the episodes, and most of the lead-up to this point. And there was that one little shading in, I forget the name of the episode, where he helped out... I can't remember her name. God, I can't remember anyone's name today. The one, you know, no one is who they seem to be. That little tidbit. That's the first hint that Jakar was not a villain. And then there's this bit where he refuses flat out to do the evil act to benefit his empire. Even though Cold Calculus says that is an easy bargain. Just done. One life for a trillion. Done. Easy. And yet, he refuses. I also think it speaks uh, volumes of how strongly the Narn in general view oaths. Remember, he said he would help her, he swore he would help her fulfill his, her oath after this was all done. And he was unwilling to go back on that. And I like that. And that'll say that, that'll that kind of lead where Jakar goes in the future, too. Garibaldi's stance is finally etched in stone in this episode as well. A lot of things are coming full circle in this one. Uh, Garibaldi, of course is the detective. I've just come, called him this many times, but you remember I never wanted to call him security or a cop. And the reason why is because Garibaldi is actually not lawful good. He's chaotic good. And now I nerd speak, for those of you who don't get it. The point being, Garibaldi wants to do what he believes the right thing and everything else can go to hell. He wants to do things by the rules. He adheres to the rules when he has to. But he is more than willing to go around the rules. Now, we've seen this in little things up to this point in time. We've seen him bypass the rules with regards to Ivanova's communique, back earth, uh, with regards to the coffee beans, again, Ivanova. There's been a few little details throughout the series so far where he has been willing to bend or bypass or break the rules because he believes what he was doing was right. That This episode really etches that in stone. The, they have a direct orders from EarthGov to, to extradite her back home so they can use her serum and yabbity freaking blue. And Garibaldi's response is no. In fact, I wrote it down, and I quote, uh, those orders stink. Now, I know that's not exactly the most eloquent phrase, but, I mean, this is Garibaldi. He doesn't need to be eloquent. He's Garibaldi. Um, <laughs> but it really shows his mindset. Who gives a damn what my orders are? This is the kind of thing I fully predict that if the circumstance allowed him, Garibaldi would be willing to tank his career to ensure that she came to justice for this. What he believes is justice, because again, not lawful good. He does, he's not interested in the court. He's not interested in orders. He's interested in doing what he believes is right. And in fact, I'm going to quote a future episode here. I'm an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth kind of guy. To him, the only acceptable response is that this butcher, this massacre woman gets punished for what she did. Vengeance is on his mind. And you could argue there's some justice involved there as well, but I gotta be honest, the only justice I could see in this situation is what actually happens with the Vorlons at the end. I know that sounds weird, but remember, vengeance is about you hurt me, so I'm gonna hurt you. Justice is about balancing the scales, and there's no actual way this woman can actually positively affect the galaxy at, to out, counterbalance how much she negatively impacted the galaxy. So the only possible outcome here, taking a third-person perspective, is removing her from the equation, and that's exactly what the Vorlons did. As an aside, when I first watched this episode back in the day, uh, for, for the first time, as based on the way the scene was presented, I'm like, oh god, something's going to happen. And I just started saying, oh god, please let her die. Please let her die. <laughs> just let her die. <laughs> so I was like cheering when the Vorlon ship came out. Anyways, uh, rewinding a little bit. I also love uh, Sinclair. He, go, he basically gives a speech to Garibaldi, and you can tell his heart's not in it. You can tell he's trying to convince himself more than he's trying to convince Garibaldi that this is, you know, this is the right thing. Think about how many lives she could save and go. And you can tell it's just tearing him up inside. The fact that he is so willing to throw her to the wolves after getting what, you know, after getting this benefit out of her really, I think, solidifies how much he despises this woman. And of course he does. Garibaldi, or excuse me, Sinclair is also uh, a very morally uh, inclined person. He is, of course, lawful good. So he is the person who was willing to follow orders and was willing to work within the bounds of legality and order and whatnot. Um, but there is still that good in there, that desire to see this wrong righted. And it is no surprise to me that he tried to worm his way around trying to ensure that the League would get her in the end. 
Now, one thing I want to point out here is I love Jakar's usage in this episode. What I mean by that is Jakar could have easily used his connections and the connections uh, that have there to allow Natath to just reach the woman, I'm just going to call her Deathwalker, and just beat her to a pummeling death. He, I mean, she almost killed her anyways before people were able to stop her. So, yeah, wouldn't be that hard. Really. What I find most interesting about this, though, is he didn't. It really showcases how Jakar is the man who really should be on Babylon 5, and how the Narn in general have... They still have that violent outset, of course. But they also have a, a capacity for politics as well. I like that. I like the fact that rather than just go and deal with the situation bluntly and brusquely like they could, they played at politics to ensure their way. Uh, they failed in the end, but whatever. Um, I also love how... Early on in the episode, we don't know the terrible price for the longevity vaccine. I forget what she calls it, but that's what I've always referred to that concept in fiction, a longevity vaccine. Uh, you can blame Alpha Centauri for that. And I love how even when we don't know the terrible price that that has, uh, Jadur still comes across as incredibly evil. I love that. No, I, I mean that sincerely. It is so appropriate. She is actually... Okay, so if, if we assume for a moment the terrible price of the vaccine doesn't exist... What she is doing is what I like to call the quiet revenge. I've talked about this many times. Uh, I don't want to share any of the stories, because I don't know how to describe it without the story. So I'll just describe her example, because her example is a quiet revenge. I am one of the my I and my people are one of the most hated, feared names in the galaxy. And everyone hates us, and everyone tells their children and their grandchildren about how terrible and horrible we were. And now they're going to have eternal life... Well, effectively eternal life, extremely elongated life and removal of disease from their lives, all because of me. And they will have to praise me and my people for the remainder of their days. That is the quiet revenge. That is the most satisfying form of revenge, uh, speaking personally. But... Unlike her, I'm not hideously evil, which brings me back to my point. She is doing this solely out of revenge. You know, she's not doing this because she wants to benefit or anything like that. She just wants the galaxy to suffer quietly. Of course, as we find out, there's actually worse behind that. You know, you have to kill someone to, to make this work, which... Well, we'll leave that. Woo! God! We'll leave that for the controversial box. Um... So, one of the things I wanted to point here, uh, I had someone comment that Babylon 5's piece is already breaking apart by episode 9. And while I get where they're coming from that, I don't think that's really what's going on here. You'll notice that we've only really seen the politics of Babylon 5 as an aggregate, like twice so far. This is not the piece, the fragile piece being shattered. This is the fact that that fragile piece doesn't exist yet. We still don't have the fragile piece. We're still working up to that point. The League of Non-Aligned Worlds and the Council are still in this weird, not-quite-balanced state yet. And it will be some time, I feel, before we actually get to the point where we can really get into the meat of that and have them function uh, in the future. And it that will happen in the future. I'll just go ahead and tell you that now. Uh, one last note here. I love the ingenuity of Ivanova's tactic to buy time. Uh, you get the impression that Babylon 5 is at least moderately well defended, and I like that. But, of course, the number of ships that come through is, is worrisome, and would probably cause casualties on what is effectively a civilian station. So, I like the idea that she engages the captains in the in, in discourse of, who has the greatest right to claim this war criminal from us? And whoever wins the debate gets to attack us first. That was very clever. Um, let's go ahead and get into the controversial... Deutsch box here really quick. This is a topic I could talk in circles around for hours. I'm not going to. Because the problem is, this is what I call a true dilemma. A.K.A. there's no good answer here. Morality and ethics of sacrifice for gain is basically what this boils down to. We've talked about this on this show many times. Uh, the I, I keep borrowing this term from Mass Effect 3, but it is such an apt term that I will continue to borrow it. Cold calculus. The idea of cold calculus, of course, saying if you have to personally, this is, okay, that's a bad way to put it, if you have to order 10 men to their deaths to save 100 men, that is the correct decision, not the right 
decision. It is not morally or ethically the correct, the right decision. It is the correct decision by held calculus to sacrifice in order to gain. That's how that works. That's how war works. It's one of the reasons why war is such a damned terrible thing and always has been. But cold calculus can apply to a number of other situations as well. Uh, one suggestion, I can't believe I'm repeating this, but I've heard this before, was the idea of, let's say here in real life, uh, we were to run around and grab homeless people and kill them and use their organs and bodies as, you know, as appropriate, you know, not just willy-nilly, but actually find people who are compatible donors to help save the lives of people who, and I'm just going to quote here, actually matter. Now, that's morally and ethically repugnant by most standards. And yet, by cold calculus terminology, you can kind of see the logic behind it. The idea that these people already live terrible, horrible lives and, and aren't going to be you know, improving anytime soon, and are probably just going to be dying in the street, the thought here being you might as well use that resource. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm having trouble referring to a person as a resource. You might as well use that resource... <clears throat> in order to benefit someone else's life is actually going to keep going on. Now, of course, the obvious counter-argument to that is obvious, and that is, why don't you try and improve their lives so they're not worthless and terrible? I mean, that's that's just the obvious thought process there. Um, why don't you try to actually put work and effort into making sure there are no homeless people? And yes, I know that's not an easy answer either. I'm well aware of that. Uh, I am also well aware of the fact that it is a problem that is solvable. I don't think... Well, I'm getting too much into politics. I'm sorry. This is why we call this the controversial box, because there's no talking about this stuff without getting into things that I almost always ignore on my show. E and in real life, too. For those of you curious, I don't just ignore, you know, hot-button topics on my show. I do that in real life, too. Even my sister and I barely talk politics or, or religion or, or whatever. There's plenty of different topics. But anyways, the, mor the morality of this, though, is what I want to examine. Because let's assume we actually did get this longevity vaccine from her. So all you have to do to make one life live for a very long time, free of disease, is kill another life. Well, we've got people who are, you know, murderers and killers and other terrible, horrible things. Why not just terminate their lives and use those to benefit others? Well, there's not that many of those people, so that's going to be a well that runs dry after a certain point. Okay, uh, what's the next step? Um, well, why don't we get the sick and the infirm, people who, oh, I don't know, have severe blood sugar issues and asthmatic problems and immune, def uh, immune system deficiencies like, say, for example, myself, and take these people who are not particularly healthy and are not likely to live long, healthy lives and terminate them early, mercifully, in order to ensure that someone else gets to live and benefit from that long life that they will not get. Now, you can see how we're already drifting a little bit into the cold calculus side of this equation. Who do we go to next? Because that's also not enough to benefit the rest of humanity. Well, uh, why don't we go ahead and look at... Um, I can't come up with anything else. You see where this is going, don't you? The problem with something like this, and I'll bring this up again in Babylon 5, is where do you draw the line? Where do you stop doing this? At what point do you no longer take lives... To benefit other lives because there has to be a point there has to be you can't just take six billion people yeah i know that's not an accurate number but whatever six billion people kill three billion of them and the other three billion keep going that's not how that works and yet that is the the bargain that was offered here and that's just speaking of earth of course never mind the other uh late nations but again we're talking about the morality of this in real life terms for example uh the organ donation thing I mentioned earlier is something that has actually been considered by certain governments at certain points in history. Take the undesirables, mercifully end their lives, and I want to stress that. It's not like we're just going out and shooting people in the streets here. Mercifully end their lives, and then harvest them in order to benefit the living. But is that morally or ethically wrong? Is that morally or ethically acceptable is what I want to phrase that as. Because, I mean... Morals and ethics, people argue this forever. I'm just going to say this flat out because it's really, really simple. What morals and ethics and good and right and wrong and bad are, are up to you. That's who decides that. You do. I do. They do. She does. He does. Whatever. Every individual person decides that. There is no aggregate. There's no consensus. Uh, there is a joint acceptability level, but that is such a huge band of gray, you wouldn't believe it. 
<laughs> even people in similar circumstances tend to have a huge variety of what they consider to be right, wrong, bad, good, etc. And of course, there's tons and tons and tons of, for lack of a better term, Kobayashi Maru scenarios. Too many situations where it's like, well, would you do this to do that? Well, I... <laughs> So, for example, what we have here is another situation in which, what would Cisco do in this situation? Now, I know that sounds like a weird comparison, but hear me out. Would Cisco kill three billion to save three billion? Probably not. Would Cisco kill a few hundred to save a few hundred? Little more likely, but remember, this is a one to one ratio here. One life for one life. There's no in between. There's no one life for ten lives. There's no one life for a million lives. So, even in that case, there's a possibility Cisco would not do this because his sense of morals and ethics would tell him, no, this is not worth it. The good does not outweigh the bad, acknowledging the bad. The second question is, what would a justice lord say about this? And it, now, now, for those of you who have never heard me make this comparison before, because I know there's plenty of people watching my Babylon 5 stuff without my other stuff, um, I've always felt that when it comes to morally and ethically questionable situations, you can divide it into Cisco's and justice lords. Cisco was willing to do morally, ethically wrong things and acknowledged that they were wrong and was tormented by the wrong. He felt bad and guilty and horrible and would and would live with that guilt for the rest of his life but he was still willing to do it because the good outweighed the bad the justice lord mentality from a, a dcau series for those of you not aware of it is the concept that well i'm going to do this bad to accomplish good because it's the right thing to do there's no guilt involved there there's no conscience involved there this is the right thing to do these are the, the justice lord mentality is looking at the cold calculus and saying 100 i, I massacre 100 people to save a thousand done that's an easy choice for them. There's no sense of, you know, oh, I'm torn up about this or whatever. They just do it because it's the right thing to do in their mind. So again, what would a justice lord do in this situation? <laughs> Three billion people, done. There we go, life forever. Completely ignoring, you know, the future and babies and, and God knows what this is going to do to procreation and whatnot. But anyways. But this also comes in in a way that I've discussed over on Voyager, believe it or not. Do you remember the episode... Uh, I don't remember the name of it. It's a season five episode. Uh, we covered it not too long ago. About... Uh, uh, Golma said, I want to say. It was, a, it was the doctor and a hologram of a Cardassian who was performing extremely ethically questionable things in order to you know, save lives and whatnot, that episode. Uh, this exact same concept came up there, so forgive me for the repetition. But the idea is, let's say under these circumstances, we try to use this, this great and wonderful serum that she has developed in order to save lives. Now, what I find interesting is, this episode of Babylon 5 never brings this topic up. At no point does the concept of tainted data even enter the script, not even once. Instead, it is all about whether or not she should be punished, regardless of the good she can do. I mention that because there is a large school of thought here in reality, in real life, that tainted data is exactly that. That it should not be used. That, it, that, that if we... Uh, and I've, I've talked about this before. You know, Some people look at that and say, well, that's wasteful. The data exists. Yes, it's regrettable that it came at the cost of suffering and horror, but the data exists. It's done. We can't undo that. Let's at least try to do some good in the galaxy. That's the first mentality, right? That's the, that's the one perspective. The other perspective is all we're doing then is justifying it. All we're doing then is making it acceptable. And what happens when escalation occurs? When someone says, well, we need to accomplish this greater good, so for the greater good, tau! Um, and that happens. And then th so things are accomplished again. A, a great evil is, is done in order to accomplish a greater good. And what happens when that becomes accepted as well? And that becomes justified because we use that tainted data and again and again until it gets worse and worse and worse. It's validating the actions of the, the, the sick and the decadent and the horrible and the evil by saying, well, you did this terrible thing, but I'm still going to benefit from it. Those are the two perspectives of this mindset. And I'm not saying either is right or wrong, by the way. Uh, that's not the point of this. Again, as I said earlier, there is no right or wrong with regards to this. There's no easy solution. There's no good answer unless you happen to be a Q and you walk in and you go, oh, psh, I can fix this. There we go. No, no further food for thought. I don't want to keep talking in circles around this. And this is the kind of thing that deserves more to be a debate. So as ever with the controversial Deutsch box, I... Uh, 
I welcome your guys' thoughts and what you think about the dilemma of this episode. Uh, now, we're going to be leading into a spoiler section, uh, so I think we'll go ahead and... See, someone suggested I do a klaxon, and I thought about that, but every sound effect I've, I've found just really didn't fit. So I'm afraid we're going to have to go with the best sound effect of all, me killing my throat. <coughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> so I love that the Vorlons obliterate her. I love that they do it for all the wrong reasons, too. These are the Vorlons. Now, this is opinion, but I think the Voilons are actually worse than the Shadows in basically every way. Incredibly manipulative, incredibly callous, fully believing in the concept of cold calculus, to, to almost as like a religion, I would say. And on top of that, um, yeah, their design here was not to save us from ourselves or to prevent some great horror. No, they just wanted to ensure that we were kept in our little box where we should be until we're ready to be pointed at the Shadows. That's it. That's all. It's also worth noting that I, I, what I just said is actually kind of not true because it's not necessarily after the shadows, but you get the idea. I uh, find that interesting. But you know what I find more interesting is that for the first time I fully understand what the hell was going on with the Talia subplot. You notice I didn't mention that at all in the primary uh, rumination that I just finished. I, I can't. I can't even talk about it without going into spoilers because... It all just fits beautifully well. They were doing uh, triggering. They were saying specific things in a specific order, in a specific way, specifically to ensure that Talia's mind, her personality, was being recorded, all of it. And so that was that crystal is Talia Winters in every way that matters. Uh, that's her personality, her mindset, her memories, etc. Written down on there and recorded from her. Now again, why? Well, we know the answer why, now that the series is done. They actually intended to bring Talia back. See, I love this because it showcases the long-term view uh, perspective that the Vorlons in general take, and especially that Kosh himself take. Let me say one thing. Kosh is awesome. The Vorlons as a whole are definitely the bad guys, but Kosh, the individual, is, is pretty cool. And I actually wouldn't be surprised if Kosh, the individual, was the one who moved forward in this, uh, in this endeavor to save Talia, because they're obviously aware of the fact that she's control. And they know that when control res uh, emerges, Talia dies, for in every, again, in every way that matters. Talia's personality would be erased by controls, and that's actually what happens later on, as we see. So, the crystal was a method, and I love that they did this in episode 9 of season 1. That is so early on. They, they did this so that they would have that imprint of the original Talia to be able to basically make a new Talia. It would not be Talia Winters, it would be, a, a, in, all, in every tense of the word, a clone of Talia Winters, but it would be a way to keep the actress and, her, and the character in the show after Control's emergence. Uh, for real life reasons, that didn't actually happen. Uh, they were intending that. That was fully the plan. Um, and then they had issues off, off screen and offset, and that couldn't come to pass, which is a bit of a shame. But I love that that seed was planted so early on. I love that type of storytelling. That's all I got for today. I'll see you guys next week where we start talking religion! <sighs> I think every episode's going to have a controversial box like from now on, isn't it? Oh, uh, whatever. Bring your pitchforks. We'll see you next time, guys.